on. Um, you know, um, he, he does talk about a lot of real things that are happening, for example, the uh, corruption, but that is a global thing. Um, he talks about um, a lot of issues uh, that you know, unfortunately, are do are, are taking place, but you know, he he does not. Um, and 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 one thing about him that, that I really like is that he does not pursue war. Uh, you know, he, right. he's, he's not a warmonger. He's he's not. A, yeah. You know, you feel that he's trying his best, and yeah. you know, yeah. try to go through peaceful ways and and means. And and I respect yeah. that. Yeah. Um, if you're just joining us, we're talking to Zina Mahana in Tehran. She is a partner and one of the collaborators in the New Horizon Conference. I just hit record on this, so I'm, I'm going to be recording this for YouTube. I hope that's okay. And uh, that way we we'll record this for posterity. And we're discussing the American journalist Reese Ehrlich and his pretty good book, The Iran Agenda. But I think, Zena, I agree with you. He's also, he's got great qualities, great anti-war qualities, but for some reason, he thinks that the Islamic Republic of Iran should go away. He doesn't feel like that it's legitimate. And yes. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it really seems to be an arrogant American attitude that, that we have the right to uh, pick other people's governments for them. And, and with the Islamic Republic, it's also, there's also a spiritual dimension. You know, I'm, I'm here now at, the, at my um, Quaker meeting house where I just had Quaker meeting. It's a, you know, a place of interfaith understanding and compassion. And, and uh, so in that spirit, I just want to say that like there's a spiritual dimension that that American policy has to understand that, um, you know, the Iranian government, as it is right now, feels like it has a spiritual calling to to exist, to 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 speak truth to power, to speak truth, to the U.S. imperialist Zionist power. And that itself is is a religious calling. It should be protected under, you know, the, our understanding of religious freedom. So. It's something that I think some people just don't get, you know, people like Reese Ehrlich. Go ahead. Um, you know, um, he, he's, he, un he undermines the fact that uh, the Sunni community um, um, in Iran, for example, um, is not free, which is not true. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to mention uh, an incident that took place uh, just a couple, uh, just two, exactly two weeks ago. Um, uh, there was the, uh, on TV, on Channel 5, there was, um, uh, they were, there was a ceremony, uh, an anniversary of the martyrdom of Imam Ali, the cousin of the prophet. And one of the poets uh, was reciting, uh, reciting a poem, right? Um, and then in that poem, he uh, sort of uh, attacked one of the, uh, what they call the Sahaba uh, of, the, uh, of the Prophet, of whom uh, the Sunnis, uh, you know, um, treat and, and feel a lot of grandeur and, and respect with, right? So mm -hmm. he attacked them. And what happened was that the next day, um, uh, of which I thought was a little bit of an extreme, what happened was that uh, they sort of uh, sacked the head of the, uh, of the TV channel because it had offended the Sunni community in Iran. And, and, and if, if that ever um, gives you a, a, you know, a sort of um, um, you know, an indication is that um, it, it's an indication of tolerance. You know, we have to respect the others. You know, we cannot go and attack other people um, based on their uh, domination or, you know, religion, religious beliefs and so forth. Though the majority, as you know, is, uh, let's say, is 70 or 80 percent are Shias in Iran. So I, I, I thought I, I thought that was an indication of uh, tolerance, you know, and, and accepting the other. Going back to Mr. Reese, um, you know, uh, again, um, I, I, I do appreciate that he is an anti-war uh, person. However, um, he does not believe in, in, the, uh, in the existence of the regime, the current regime. I mean, if, if I would, uh, if, if any Iranian would come up and say, I don't, ex I don't believe in the existence of, uh, uh, you know, the, the Trump administration, what would the reaction of the Republicans or those people who do follow Trump, for example? You know, um, it, it's it's good to res it, okay. I, I might not agree with you, but I do respect. Um, at, at least we have to have, find some common dominators. We we can't keep on uh, calling for war, and 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 we are aware that the the, the incident that took place two days ago, while um, uh, you know the the, pre the Japanese prime minister was here, it was right. all false, false flags. 
uh, even the one before that with, with, the, uh, with the UAE tankers, again, false flags. Again, they're trying to sort of uh, drag Iran into it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what is the, tell us more about the uh, opinion of the common people in Iran. Uh, do, do people feel like this is a setup? Do, the, do people feel that if there's any possibility that the Iranian government could have been behind the attacks on the tankers in the Gulf of Oman? Yeah, th this is a good question because uh, you see uh, the, the perception or the, or the propaganda that America is trying to, to give to the world is that the Iranian nation or people among themselves, they, you know, they, they don't want the regime, they, they want a regime change, you know, they're, they're fed up. They might have some um, uh, qualms with the regime, you know, they might have a couple of, of issues or some issues with the regime. But when it comes to their security, when it comes to their, the, I've never seen a nation as unified as the Iranian nation. You know, uh, they might not agree with the leader with everything. They might not agree with their president with everything, but they, they, they are very cultured people. They're very well-learned people. And, and they are aware that this is a conspiracy and, and these things are false flags. And, and believe me, whether they are, uh, you know, if, if they reserve their hijab or their religion, if they're conservative or, you know, liberal, so-called liberal, believe me, when it comes to the leader, at the end of the day, they follow whatever he says. And they are aware um, of, of the um, hegemony that, that is just so uh, targeted towards them. And no, they do not believe that the Iranian government or the Navy that has done this. No, they're not. They're, they're not that shallow. I mean, no one, I mean, there might be some people who might, you know, uh, you know, misunderstand things, but the Iranians are very smart people and, and, and they're very proud people. Very proud. Yes. Great. And your husband, uh, Haj Nader Kelebzeda? Yeah, he's, he is. He's here. Give me a second. Let oh, great, just, uh, great. <laughs> that was my subtle, <laughs> my subtle cue to <laughs> see if he was ready for show business. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll give a snappy intro. His his intro is he's a friend of mine. He's a, a filmmaker. He made a film called The Messiah, which is about yes. Jesus of Nazareth from an Islamic perspective, which really blew my mind. It's kind of like you know, after twelve years of Catholic the Catholic school. We watched Jesus of Nazareth a lot, which is a kind of a, a, a certain kind of Jesus film. But, but Hodge's film, I mean, Nader's, Nader's film uh, is, is equally great. And, and uh, anyway, he's a TV journalist. He has a show called The Time on Channel One in Iran. And I've been on his show a couple of times. And he's your lovely husband. And, uh, yes, yes. Uh, you, you know, before he comes in, I, I, I want to tell you my experience with the with the movie, uh, the oh, Jesus great. movie. Are you in the um, movie? Uh, are you in the uh, Are no. you in the Messiah? <laughs> no, Were I'm you the not, Virgin Mary? Not, You're not the Virgin I'm, Mary. No. <laughs> you look like the, <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> look like the Virgin Mary. Magdalene, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not at all. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you my experience uh, about the movie. When um, you know, we uh, I, I, I'm Lebanese, so I I, I come from a, um, a country that is uh, multi-religious. A lot of dominations, more than 18 dominations exist in Lebanon. And the other day we were talking, uh, I think Sandra and I, we were talking, do you remember we talked about St. Uh, uh, Marshalbel? Do you remember St. Yeah, Saint Charbel, Charbel yes. Mapalouf, yes. Yes. We, we, yes. We will visit him. We will visit his grave, yes, yes. in Beirut this September, yeah. So, yeah, Zaina, you, you're, you, uh-oh. You, you know, all these Hollywood movies, um, you know, they always give that impression of Jesus as somebody who is um, a sort of a very forgiving, of which he is, but, you know, the, you know, he, he's not, you know, like, you, you know, that, that proverb, well, if you slap me on my right, I'll, I'll give you my left cheek and so forth, right? So, but in Nader's movie, uh, what really caught me about the character of Jesus was that he was, he had a very strong very firm, and, and, and I told him, I, 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 
I, I've never seen Jesus portrayed that way. You know, he right. was very determined, you know, very strong about his beliefs. And, and, and the war that he went through with the Jews at that time, the Hachams at that time, I mean, it, it, it just, it was, it was unbelievable. Um, and anyway, Nadja got, came in and uh, uh, the floor is his. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll come back and Thank talk you. to you later, Zaina. Great talking to you. Hello, okay. Hi, Tala How are you? How are you uh, we're honored. We're honored, sir, to have you back here at our conference. We have a lot of That's people me. on. We have about 15 people on, and we're recording this for YouTube. And we were just talking about the Messiah, your master work. And you have a new TV show now on Iranian television, right? Exactly, exactly. Sure, sure. Yes. I have a weekly show that's starting off, and I hope, uh, God willing, it will be successful and it's based upon speaking with uh, Western intellect about what's going on, a combination of those who are aware in the West and those in my country to build bridges, to be, to be short, to build bridges. Great, great. Well, we have activists uh, from across our country on today. Uh, we also have your old friend, uh, Scott Bennett and Michael Springman are, are also on. We're gonna hear from Scott later after we hear from you. And we also have some questions from people that are, some people are chatting and asking questions so people can ask questions. But let's dive right into it. The Gulf of Oman, how certain are you that that was a false flag attack? Um, I'm pretty certain from what I intuitively gathered and from what I get from documents that it was definitely a false flag. And it was to detract attention from the meeting that was between the prime minister of Japan mm -hmm and the Iranian leader, and this has precedence. Um, and it did detract. Nobody found out exactly what was going on, what was mentioned, what was asked by the prime minister of Japan, and what was the leader's response. And I think this is a very, this is very important to remember that uh, the leader of Iran from the time that he was president, somebody somewhere decided that whenever he appears in the international realm, he should not be seen or something should camouflage him. And it, it works every time. Every time he's on the international scene and he's to be seen, they, they do something to dis, distract. About that incident, um, I believe it was in, uh, probably an Israeli operation. Uh, they have the sophistication and, the, and the, they have the precedence to do these things. Uh, and it did, it is, it is not to the benefit of Iran to do anything like that. And Iran does not have a precedence in doing things like that. It's not to the benefit of Iran. Iran wants the Gulf to be safe, to be secure, to be a free way for the exporting and importing of oil. This is how we have our livelihood. I mean, the sanctions have crippled us, and that's exactly what the U.S. sanctions have done. They have uh, try to limit us in our very livelihood. So why would we want to make the waters unsafe? This is against logic. But to, to have it be a pretext for war is part of what they're doing. They, they want this, they're trying to start and spark something. And there are enough elements in the White House <coughs> who are, um, you know, planners for this, for this, and uh, they have announced it already, and they jumped the gun to announce that it's, it's Iran's fault, and that, that this was a false, this was uh, an event that Iran is behind it, like the other tanker a while ago uh, off the Emirates. All these, I believe, are concocted, uh, not, not in this area, but uh, in, in Tel Aviv, and, and uh, this is, uh, this is my, my, uh, and I think an intuitive pickup from all the evidence that has appeared so far. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to note that the U.S. Uh, presenting their argument, it's not evidence-based. It's they say that, well, we think it's the Iranians because nobody, we can't think of anybody else that could possibly do this attack. You know, it's like, well, if you, if you think a little bit harder, you probably could think of other people <laughs> in the region that could do the, you know, a sophisticated military state that's nuclear armed, perhaps, could pull yes. off an attack like this, right? Or, you know, analyzing why it, it, it wasn't torpedoes, but it was uh, missiles. It was airborne missiles, uh, according to 
one of the executives from the Japanese shipping liner. And, Mayor, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, Sandra, if I could chime in on say something real quick. Sure. This is Scott Bennett, everybody, U.S. Army veteran, psyops expert. I, I, I did psychological operations in the past. I worked for the State Department and the Army. This, aside, I agree with Nader 100%. This is a false flag operation most likely conducted with the Mossad, could be MI6, CIA, and Saudi Arabia all wrapped up into one. But it, pre it presents an opportunity for a diplomatic victory. President Trump, I do not believe, is behind this. I think this is a coup d'etat usurpation involving Bolton and Pompeo and the other warmongers in the military industrial complex. But it presents an opportunity for a uh, chess move by the Iranians, by the Chinese, by the Japanese uh, and the Russians to create a diplomatic liaison opportunity for Iran and the United States to engage in a, con a, a discussion about this specific incident and use that to bleed off into discussions of other topics and such like that, using Abe, using the Japanese as the embassy, the liaison instrument, for back channel communications with the president, uh, which can occur in Lebanon and elsewhere. Uh, the Russians could pay a, play a, a part in that. They are the dominant uh, political factor in the Middle East. There's a massive paradigm shift in that direction. So getting ahead of this is key. And, and uh, Iran and Abe uh, need to be shoulder to shoulder. And Abe needs to say, we're about the facts. And we've already said our people have said this was not a mine. And Iran, by by releasing the political uh, you know prisoner that they had, I, I I said on press TV the other day that was a brilliant maneuver because when they do that, they they demonstrate superiority, they demonstrate confidence, they they demonstrate generosity. They are not reacting as the deep state wants them to react. They want Iran to to uh, implode on themselves like a turtle into its shell and re react with vicious hostility and name calling and shoe throwing and everything like that. Iran does the opposite. And uh, it, it creates an opportunity for them to say, uh, we will have a discussion with the President Trump about this uh, subject. We have no problem. We will share everything we have because he's being lied to. The American people are being lied to like they were lied to in Iraq. And we want peace and stability. And I, I think this is how this event needs to be played. And it will expose Bolton and Pompeo and the others who have been pushing this. So yes. take advantage Scott, of this. Yeah. Don't lose to it. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that point, Scott. And uh, before we let uh, Nader respond, I just wanted to say, I think Scott's got a point. I think it's coming not from Trump himself. Trump you know, tried to de-escalate in Syria and then was trumped by Bolton, who said, no, we're not going to de-escalate the troops out of Syria. But I just wonder, Nader, what do you think about this assertion? It seems that I think war could be an, it could be inevitable if, they, if his team, if Bolton and Giuliani and Pompeo convinced Trump that the Gulf of Oman was real, if they, if they put together enough uh, of an argument, uh, kind of like uh, the way that Bush and Powell put together a flimsy argument and more or less convinced the UN Security Council to uh, support the invasion of Iraq. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's a good question and it's a good uh, reference to the war that happened, uh, the artificial, well, the, 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 false, uh, the false attack um, the, or the, the false reasons for the attack, a legitimate war against <laughs> Iraq uh, and taking over that country. Not that Saddam was our friend, but um, but I think the circumstances with Iran are different. Iraq at that time was not ready to defend itself. When the Americans attacked Iraq, it was already dispersed. The army was dispersed. There wasn't that much resistance. And uh, that's why they could do it. And they knew about that. I mean, the intelligence knew that Iraq could not provide the resistance. I mean, we fought Iraqis for eight years. And many times they, they would fight to the last bullet. I mean, I can tell you that from the accounts that we know uh, very close from the documents and the books that we have today, so many books. The Iraqis were fierce fighters. I mean, they, Saddam would kill anybody who retreats. He would, he would kill so many commanders. He would, he would kill ministers. Uh, so uh, he would terrorize the state and they had very fierce resistance. But when it came to the Americans coming into Iraq, they offered no resistance. 
with the case of Iran, it is totally different. I mean, look at the letter of those 70 something generals and former officials to President Trump that uh, this is not an area you can mess around with easily. Yes, Iran will be damaged, but the US will be probably damaged more because of the circumstances. So the circumstances is a very, of course, this is logic, and I think Trump has stuck to logic. He still has his own private, individual way of walking. And that's what makes him a little bit different, despite the neocon pressure. The neocon pressure is really an obsessive pressure. It's a crazy pressure. It's like, uh, they, they're not gonna send their sons to the war. Everybody knows that neocons have a precedence, but they're not gonna send their sons. Who's gonna get killed is other people's sons. Who's gonna get damaged? Other people are gonna get damaged. For the safety of Israel, they would do anything. Uh, and, but uh, so far, thank God, the, the prevalence has been with those who have um, persisted to pursue and convince Trump that no, do not get tricked and hoaxed into a war with Iran. Uh, I mean, um, not um, that, Nader, uh, and so, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, in a bigger picture, it seems that there's a, um, uh, it seems that there's kind of a larger propaganda war already underway from our country against your country, including the terrorist designation of the Iran Revolutionary Guard. I remember when your conference um, was over and we flew out of the airport in Mashhad and, and we, I saw some IRGC people there because they're, they're known for airport security or they run the airports in Iran. And I later yeah, learned right. from Reese Ehrlich's book that they control about 9% of the economy. So that's an interesting thing. What else should we know about the IRGC and what's your take on the recent US State Department terrorist designation? I think uh, what happened, uh, Sander, quite honestly, and you might not hear this from other sources, it's my take, is uh, America was pushing to get the FATF CFT signed in Iran, which would control basically everything Iran is doing and supposedly Iran is uh, a terrorist uh, entity. And so the, uh, by signing the FATF and the CFT, we will be in a very different situation. Well, the FATF got signed. What are those and, documents? Uh, tell, us, tell us what that means. Yeah, Financial Action Task Force. In other words, uh, the, uh, supposedly, this was, this was done 12 days after 9-11. This clause was added to the money laundering clause. And it meant that all those entities who support terrorism in the world uh, once you sign this, we're able, we, we should be able to track you down. We should be able to take your accountant's uh, account of what you're doing with your money. So Iran would be under the surveillance of the U.S., basically, if you sign the FATF. Well, the FATF did get signed in the parliament. When it got to the Majma or the, uh, another council of experts, it got stopped because in the Iranian media, and I was part of that, uh, I did two individual programs where I exposed the FATF, the head of the FATF said, we are responsible for crippling Iran's economy to one fourth its value. Uh, that was if you had $100 one day, it's worth $25 now. Right. And we, we are the one who did it. And this got broadcast. Once it got broadcast, the Majma, everybody significant in the Majma started voting the next day against the FATF and the CFT. And so that, that is stuck now. In Iran, the FATF is not being endorsed and it's not being signed. And it, so what, what happened in the parliament is probably is going to be also uh, nullified. This, is, this process, of course, is not finished yet. They have to make the final announcement in the Majma or the Council of Experts. But what happened is that frustrating note when they realized the FATF would not be signed in Iran. Iran would not be under surveillance of the West of whatever it does. Then they sanction IRGC. No one connects these two dots together. Once the FATF be it became apparent to the West, to America, that it will not be signed by Iran, they said, okay, the hell with it. We're going to just sanction IRGC. Now the IRGC is an ideological army. It, is con it, it, is, it consists of people 
the, the leaders, the generals, uh, are all people who are veterans of the eight-year war. They're people who are, are religious. They understand the Velayat of Fari concept. They are the people who are very, very dedicated. They're, not, they're, they're willing to sacrifice themselves readily. And this is the power of the IRGC. The late Imam said about the IRGC that it's like the wings of the revolution. And this is exactly what it is. And it is formidable. Uh, uh, besides the IRGC, there's the Basij, the voluntary uh, group that uh, connects. And, you know, we have, that's a pretty good, big group right there, volunteer forces. Besides the IRGC, Iran has a large uh, paramilitary volunteer group that they're all religious. They're, they're, you see, the point here, Sanders, is people who are willing to sacrifice their lives, people who are religious, people who believe in the day of justice, the day of judgment, people who, like the Christian brothers who believe in the day of judgment, they, they believe very sternly and they believe that, uh, so they're, they're faithful people. This is the power of the IRGC. And that's why it's fearful. And that's why they fear, you, you can't really buy these people out. These people cannot be bought with under the table, you know, uh, handsome money. You can't do that. It, it has a history. You might have some corrupt elements here and there, but basically the IRGC is a formidable body and uh, they've, they've, they've been trying to curb it for the longest time. I was also very concerned with the fact that Google and YouTube recently banned Press TV from uploading any new content onto YouTube. Was that something that also concerned you? Yes, of course, they've been trying to stifle any alternative voice. And Press TV, if it doesn't have anything else, it, has, it does offer that alternative position. It gets, invites American thinkers and intellectuals who, have, who offer views that in America, the mainstream media would censor. Uh, many of your guests, many of the intellectuals in America who've woken up after 9-11 and after the fake attack on Iraq, and they're sick and tired of what's going on with, with, with the neocon influence, they're censored in, in the mainstream media. And so when uh, one mainstream media in another country like Iran invites them, that, uh, that, that media has to be stifled. They, they have been tolerating uh, press TV for some time, but they got tired of that. And that's why... We have that. They don't want, actually, they don't want dissident Americans to appear and talk and, and uh, to have a voice. That's, I think, the bottom line. I lost, I lost your voice. You're muted, Sander. You've muted yourself. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, thank you, Richard, for stepping in there. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Everything's good? Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, great, great. We have one of our viewers asking a question about uh, what about there's a recent summit of intelligence. Um, uh, the question is, what about this trilateral summit of Russian, American, and Israeli national security advisors? Do you have any comment on that, Nader? Well, I, I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this has two points. First, it's psychological warfare. When you say they're getting together, you, you think they're going to be cooking up something. And the second thing is that they're really cooking up something. I mean, psychological warfare, and also they're implementing their plans. They're, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're rehashing what they have and considering new steps. They're trying to be innovative and creative. And uh, so it's something to watch out. We'll be watching it closely. I mean, we watch what the FDD does, Foundation for the Defense of Democracy. All those people who used to be part of the project for New American Century are now this FDD. And we, we have been watching the FDD very carefully every year when they have a summit and they gather in Washington because all the key players appear there. Some come from America, some come from, from Israel. And then they sit down and they talk and they make plans. So, um, we, we, I think we'll be watching this intelligence summit very carefully, but I think it has a twofold function. One is psychological warfare, as if they're going to be doing something, you have to be afraid. Uh, and the, the second is 
yes, they're going to probably sit down and think what to do next. I mean, they're, they're thinking what steps to take next. Every time they've done something, it hasn't produced the fruits they wanted. The Emirati thing with the ships, they try to blame it on Iran, it backfired. With this thing with the two, two ships in the Oman Gulf, it hasn't got any, because there's so many other conflicting um, uh, uh, opinions about there being drones and they coming from the air that uh, they haven't been able to fulfill. And so it's backfiring again. So they, they have to think about the next plan. I think that's the purpose. Great. So if, Lara, if Lauren Ashcraft is uh, on the call, please send me a text. Let me know which number you are. And uh, John Lomenzo is off of mute. So I think John Lomenzo in uh, Colorado, I believe, has a question regarding Valerie Plain. John, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. You, you look good. You sound great. You sound really loud. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I'm in Santa Fe. I'm back in Santa Fe. Uh, good for you. Good for you. Uh, Nader, I attended the Valerie Plam seminar last September called um, Spies, Lies, and Nukes. And it was a presentation by a panel of uh, Ms. Plam's former CIA associates. And uh, during a breakout session for lunch, I sat at a table with uh, Mary Beth Long, who's a longstanding uh, CIA employee and secretary uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense for a number of years. At that table was an individual who all, all of a sudden put a schematic on the table showing a map of Iran and uh, bordered by Saudi Arabia and Turk Turkmenistan. And he was trying to get uh, Ms. Long's attention uh, about a, 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 uh, a uh, operation which was being conducted by Sayanim. You know the term Sayanim? No, I don't. Okay, that's the uh, unofficial citizen supporters of uh, the Likud party or the, uh, the Israeli government. They, they, right. they work as civilians, and this individual is connected with the uh, movie industry out of Hollywood, very high influential people. And what this individual said in front of all of us is not classified information is that there is a current operation being um, cyber war uh, cyber infiltration of Iranian uh, internet and it's being directed at the youth of Iran and it's very it's a psychological warfare where they they entice whoever finds this site to, to click, you know, bait click, and to uh, get involved in conversations. It sounds like, and I don't know if anybody in Iran knows about this, but I just saw this particular individual on Memorial Day and asked him how his project was going, and he said it was going well. Um, are, do you, are you in Iran aware of this uh, cyber attack? surveillance on, on the part of this Israeli operation? No, I, I will not be the, the proper individual to talk about this because I'm not aware about some of the details, those who work with this in this entity, which is pretty important. Uh, well, we'll probably have more details, but there is an onslaught. There is an onslaught in, in, the, in, this, in the cyber realm. Definitely there is. And there is, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of stuff going on, as, as also, uh, there's, a, you know, there, there's so many television satellite stations right. in Farsi directed at the youth of Iran. Right. Uh, there's, a series, uh, there's a series of television channels that are being broadcast uh, called GEM, GEM TV. They have GEM TV Junior, GEM, GEM TV Kids, they have GEM TV Travel, GEM TV Talk Shows, and whatever you want from the West, it's dubbed into Farsi. I mean, these things are dubbed in the Emirates or some countries around Iran. So it's that they, they have been uh, investing a lot about influencing Iranian youth with programs from the West. And it's been um, pretty provocative to the point that many people, common people, and common people in small towns who would watch these, um, this is not like one or two stations, it's over 30 stations. All the work is being dubbed. I mean, 
it's like National Geographic dubbed, Discovery Channel dubbed. Uh, well, this 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 operation this operation is coming uh, out of the Hollywood nexus, and what I'd like you to do yes. now there is to grab my email address off the screen. I think you can see it. Okay. Can you, can you see my email address? Yeah. Grab I don't that. See, but I'll, I'll get get it later on from Sanders. Okay. Yeah. But anyway. just, uh, yeah. You can just uh, send it to us in the chat, and uh, you can chat with everyone. Okay. But anyway, that's basically. I wanted to get that out. I've been trying to get it out, but I've been unsuccessful until this moment. And I've got a lot more information on it. Great, John. Uh, Thanks a lot for the it. comment. Okay. Yeah, I would appreciate it because a lot of people in Iran ask me about what's going on, what's the source of it, and some people like yourself who is surveying and has surveillance of what's in the, in the cyber and other realms will be very interesting for the audience because we are under assault. And this is I'll, not I'll, I'll get it to you, Nader. I'll get it to you. Okay. Appreciate that. Great. Great. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Um, yeah, good, good. Yeah. Um, we have, I said that this call would go from 12.30 to 1.30. Uh, we could go for a little bit longer. Uh, I'm willing to go a little bit longer if anybody uh, has an opinion on that, you can always send me a chat. There's a way to chat with me individually, or you can chat with the entire group. I don't mind. Either way, uh, I'm trying to uh, find, if I don't know who you are, if you haven't signed into Zoom with an actual um, name, then I don't know who you are. I know uh, we were trying to get a congressional candidate, Lauren Ashcraft, to maybe make a comment or ask a question. But, uh, but anyway, um, um, good. So um, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to unmute the audio for some people I think might have a question. Maybe Richard Cox, um, uh, maybe Rick Stagenborg in the West Coast. Uh, so if you have any questions in our final, uh, let's say we'll go for another 15 minutes. All right, folks. Does that sound good, Nader? Can you go for another 15 minutes with us? Good. Sure, sure, great. Sure. Okay. Great, great, great. You know, Sandra, one thing I'd, I'd like to hear, if, if possible, uh, you know, J. Michael Springman, who I respect uh, very, very much, I, I wanted to give him the chance to talk about anything regarding the legalities of the sanctions, the new uh, development, the Zionist uh, connection to the sanctions of the Treasury. I I'll let uh, J. Michael Springman uh, talk about what he wants, but I think that's enormously significant. We are witnessing our rights as American citizens being strangled by a tyranny that is attempting to restrict us from practicing our freedom of speech and practicing and exercising our religion. It is our religious freedom that is inviolable from any president, any Congress, any Supreme Court, any agency at all, we have a right to practice our religion. And that means going to Iran or any other country on this planet and giving our testimony of truth, giving our testimony about whatever subject that uh, are, are on our heart as a witness for uh, religious uh, freedom and exercise of truth and, and uh, all of those dimensions. And we are witnessing that being constricted and strangled and threatened by the sanctioning of, of uh, Nader and New Horizon. And we have to work around that through creative ways if necessary, but it needs to be uh, uh, combated and overcome and uh, by all means necessary, uh, but at the same time, perhaps bringing in uh, different entities so that we are not uh, uh, you know, able to be uh, brought into any sort of trouble by these powers. But I'll defer to uh, you, Sandra, J. Michael Springman. Go ahead. Great, Scott. Thanks. That's a good point. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, Nader, your wife earlier mentioned the shrine in Mashhad, which sponsored us and helped us get there to the, to the holy city of Mashhad. And a lot of people have never even heard of a city named Mashhad. It's in right. eastern Iran. It's kind of, you know, a little, it's a bit of a day's drive from Afghanistan. But um, it is a holy city. It's a lot cleaner than Tehran. And I actually like it more than Tehran. <laughs> Uh, and it has a shrine in it. And I had a really, um, I don't want to like um, overblow it, but I had a very um, spiritual experience at this shrine, just praying, sitting in meditation. It was a beautiful experience. And I felt like, ah, this is what Islam is really all about, you know? And so Scott's got a great point that this is an issue of religious freedom, that if, if there are Zionist entities and personnel that have infiltrated our U.S. Treasury and are pushing 
a biased point of view uh, in favor of war, in favor of the demonization of Iran, in favor of sanctions, then we should know about that. And that's what Michael Springman exposed. So Michael, I know you mentioned this earlier, but I didn't have it recording earlier. So Mr. Springman, former diplomat in, for the United States of America in Saudi Arabia, would you please come back on? I think you're on unmute and let us know what you found about who is heading, who's the undersecretary for treasury and sanctions and terrorism now? Sure, I, I got into this through a uh, request by Hafsakara Mustafa to write an article for a website she was going to put up. And I did some research and found out through some things that uh, Philip Giraldi, the former CIA official had written, and uh, things I had found online and on uh, congressional testimony, uh, that essentially the woman, uh, the Undersecretary of the Treasury for Terrorism and Financial Information, which controls the sanctions through the Office of Foreign Assets Control and uh, intelligence through the foreign, uh, through the mm, um, FinCEN uh, financial, um, um, I'm losing it. Uh, anyway, FinCEN uh, is Sigal Pearl Mandelker. Uh, she is most likely still an Israeli. She was born in Israel, raised in Israel, and at her confirmation hearing in front of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations, uh, Senate uh, Financial Committee, uh, said that she owed uh, her values and her outlook on life from her parents who were, as children were hiding out from the Nazis in uh, uh, Central Europe. She didn't say any one word about her background and her ability and uh, her um, capabilities of doing her job. Uh, but this position had been established by George W. Bush and has been held by Zionists ever since. Uh, it has continued through the Obama administration, and now in the Trump administration, he appointed Mandelker as the, the undersecretary in the 2017, and uh, she's someone who's been carefully groomed uh, by the Zionists in the American government. She worked the tra uh, at the uh, Justice Department's National Security Division. She'd been a, a clerk to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, and she was getting a million dollars a year at the law firm in New York City, Proskauer Rose. So the woman is basically carrying out Israeli foreign policy and doing her best to attack Iran and to attack Russia and do its, their, her and their very best to uh, cripple the countries and to make people very unhappy, very short of food, very short of medicine, uh, very short of everything that makes life worthwhile. And no one questions this. Uh, and I don't agree with the view that uh, Trump doesn't know what he's doing. He handpicked Mandelker, he handpicked Bolton, and he handpicked Pompeo. So I believe that what we've got is a Zionist occupied government as the journalist Wayne Madsen is always fond of pointing out. So uh, we've got to publicize this. Uh, you know, if you want to hire an attorney to fight uh, sanctions, uh, they charge hundreds of thousands of dollars and don't promise winning. And, uh, you know, we've got to get the, the light of uh, day focused on this and make the cockroaches run for cover. Uh, nobody reports in the press about this what her attitude is, is she still an Israeli, and so on. I've even asked the Israeli embassy here in Washington about that and got no response. So uh, we, we've got, uh, got a, a, a Israel, our oldest enemy, is better in control of American and domestic uh, foreign policy. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, and what we've learned about the 9 11 attacks. Um, you know, without in engaging in any anti-Semitism or any anti-Jewish people, you know, but just, just pointing out that, that there is a level of scholarship, you know, um, you can, you can, um, you know, for instance, the five dancing Israelis, this is something that the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry is certainly interested in, and they've, they've talked about it as a possible, um, subject to, to investigate further with their legal actions about the 9-11 cover-up. So I feel that, that it, is, it is relevant to talk about this. Um, and we can't do it from uh, any kind of um, anti-Semitic basis. You know, we have to do it out of a love for justice and a love for equality, but uh, also a love for human rights and the rights of Palestinians. And uh, so um, we are in our last, uh, eight minutes of the call. And um, we have a few final questions from people. I believe we have um, 
Well, before I bring up Lauren Ashcraft for US Congress, I'm gonna say this. Um, this has been a really great weekend for peace and international diplomacy. Uh, the nationally known peace activist, Medea Benjamin, is interested now in doing a, a, an event with us uh, here at the Quaker Meeting House on 15th Street in Rutherford, where I'm reporting live from here today. We're gonna to be doing a gathering around this. She recently stood up and was, uh, uh, I think, moved by the spirit of truth to confront the masters of war at the Hudson Institute last fall and uh, stood up in, in the name of preventing an attack on Iran and uh, was heroic in that way. So, um, um, so it's been really great because I invited her onto the call. She wasn't able to make it due to a conflict that she had. But, um, you know, I'm in touch now with Iranian American activists uh, in the DSA. I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, and as a lot of you know, I also ran for Congress here in the 12th Congressional District of Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn up against a very centrist, right-leaning, pro-war Democrat named Carolyn Maloney. And I've been begging God to send us a candidate who's maybe younger and maybe more female than me <laughs> who could have, a, have a, a, a better chance at beating Maloney. And, uh, and we might have our candidate in Lauren Ashcraft. Lauren, are you there? Can you hear me? Or maybe I have to put you on unmute. Hold on a second. Lauren Ashcraft. Lauren, can you hear me? Here, I'm going to unmute her. Yeah, OK. I'm going to, so I'm going to try this. Lauren, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, good. Can you Excellent. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lauren, which, awesome. which one, what's the last four digits of your number? 0398. OK, I see you now. Hold on a second, just one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me now, Lauren? Yes, can you hear Great. me? Great, yes, exactly. Yeah, I can hear you. It's just that I had to unmute every, I had to mute everybody and unmute everybody. Uh, okay, I mean, no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, you're here on our international call. I know you joined us earlier in a smaller version of this call uh, on Thursday, but now we've actually got uh, Nader and Xenia from Tehran here, and we have a nationwide activist. So um, uh, tell us your thoughts on uh, the, the potential of U.S.-Iranian conflict and what we can do about it. Yeah, so first of all, I wanted to thank you for having me on this call. And um, I think any conversation where uh, people can come together across party lines and discuss how we can maintain peace rather than escalation of a conflict is really important. So I am really interested in peaceful diplomacy rather than um, I have studied international relations in undergrad and it's illuminating to see the United States um, history of intervening in conflicts that we have nothing to do with and um, starting wars that went nowhere. And um, I am really against us acting as such an aggressor in world politics if it's not in order to, for instance, save people or um, make the world a better place, which we have not really done in a long time. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, what's going on with Iran right now is reminding me, and I know that some other participants have said that it's not, that it's, it's not apples to apples, but this conflict already is reminding me of um, how we approached the, uh, the invasion of Iraq. And I mean that in the way that there are buzzwords and um, we don't really have evidence yet of uh, who completed the attacks and pointing fingers at a country that we just don't have any evidence yet and yeah. talking about attacking and starting another war and I'm absolutely no, <laughs> like yeah. hard no for repeating the same things over and over, not I mean, this is our lifetime that we've seen the invasion of Iraq, and um, no. 
Yeah. So I, I'm absolutely wanting to have more talks like this to um, discuss how we can maintain peace between um, our country and the Middle East, um, including Iran. And I absolutely am not for um, sending people over, um, risking their lives and putting us in uh, increasingly aggressive situations when we have zero evidence. Great. Well, you know, it's funny here at the Quaker Meeting House in Manhattan today, I actually talked about Congress at the social hour after the meeting. And what uh, there's a guy that's been in New York politics for a while. He's a progressive. And he said, we just have not had uh, any kind of cost for the lies that get us into war. Gulf of Tonkin, 9-11, uh, Iraq war. There, there's, there's just, there, because of the character of Congress, you know, there, there, there is no price that Bush or Colin Powell or Cheney have had to pay for lies. And, and that's actually got me on the topic of you and all the many different people now that are stepping forward to run up against centrist Democrat Hillary Clinton clones like Carolyn Maloney. So uh, kudos to you. And uh, tell us your website for people that want to get more information about you. Oh, thank you. Um, so my website is laurenashcraft.com and all of my platform is seated there and happy to have visitors. There's also a link you can click on to just send me a message if you have questions and you can use that to just be in touch with me or if there's something that you do see um, on the platform you have questions about, I'm really happy to go into more detail with you. Um, Great. Great. Yeah, yeah, I know it's heating. It's going to be heating up for you this later this year. And, and, uh, and so good luck to you. I hope we stay in touch. And, and I know we will. Yeah, I look forward to it, too. And I just wanted to echo your sentiments about um, uh, people like Dick Cheney have not paid the price. In fact, they've profited from it. So I am running against having big money in politics and against politicians having kickbacks for things like starting wars. Um, and causing the loss of what was it 600,000 lives in Iraq um, so I am I am totally 100% interested in continuing uh, discussions on maintaining peace and really hope that uh, we can stay in touch and continue these conversations great thank you Lauren appreciate it and um, thank you good good uh, well we are at the uh, 145 mark and uh, I think uh, it might be a good time to start to wrap up unless anybody has any other questions, you could chat, uh, send me a chat. And uh, um, Nader Taleb Zeta or Zania Mahana in Tehran, do you have any final thoughts you wanted to share with us before we wrap it up? If you're still there. Oh, wait, uh, wait, 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 you're wait. On, you're on mute, Nader, I you're know, on I'm, mute. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I put them on mute. Uh, what an amateur. All right, here, I'm gonna unmute everybody. Okay. Um. <clears throat> can I ask, by the way, how can we find the Messiah to see it? Yes, that would be. Um, yeah. yeah, okay, that's, that's a very good question, and thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna have Zaina send you the parts of the Messiah which have been dubbed into English in Melbourne, Australia, in a very good studio. It's nine parts, 30 minutes each. And uh, yes, uh, Zaini will send it to you, Sandra, and you can give it to our dear guest. Thank you. I did find it on YouTube once, David. Uh, it's worth seeing. Uh, that's how I found it. There's a very grainy version on YouTube, and I'm sure um, Nader might be able to find, give you a, a better version. Uh, yeah. for, for those of you that don't know, stay tuned uh, uh, and keep in touch because there's a conference coming up in September, the New Horizon Conference. Nader, that's, that's still uh, going forward as planned? Yes, despite everything, it's, it's there and it's, it's, it's shining and we're waiting for all of you. Great, great. So that's, uh, I know Scott Bennett is planning to go and I'm planning to go, inshallah, uh, if it's possible. And um, Sandra, uh, I think I think Zanny wants to, to, to make a point. So just hold on a second. Great. I'm going to put Zanny. Do you want to keep listening? Well, I think it's near the end. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Right, that's um, why. Just, Eva, do you want to keep this? Okay, are you listening back here to this? Hold on one second. Are you listening to this? Unmute Zaina, Sander. Yeah, I did. I did. I know. Thank you. Okay, okay Zaina, you're now unmuted. Sorry about that. It just takes a minute to uh, unmute you. Go ahead. Okay, uh, just, um, I just want to thank you again, Sandra, and thank um, all your guests. They've been very kind. Um, um, I like the attitude of anti-war uh, uh, th that we hear from, from you and, and all your friends. Um, just one last thing. I, I, I want people to, um, I want to remind people that our conference, uh, the New Horizon one, uh, that's coming up on, um, in September, is going to be funded by uh, unsanctionable entities. There are oh, three good. strong. Thank you. Thank you. One is Mashhad. Uh, the other one is in Iraq, which is the Imam Hussein shrine. The third one is in uh, Syria, which is the say the Zainab shrine. Um, and hopefully, so I don't think you're going to be in danger. Um, the other issue that is important, and we did talk to a lawyer, somebody who has um, an, an ambassador, actually, and he told us that Lebanon has not signed, um, is actually in, in a un unilateral sanction with the U.S., meaning that if the U.S. does sanction certain entities, Lebanon does not have to abide to them. It's not a bilateral agreement. It's a unilateral agreement. So th this would make bit more um, comfortable and um, again the source of funding is not the IRGC it's not an Iranian source it's not a governmental source it's a shrine it is three shrines actually thank you father in heaven thank you God <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> thank you for the intercessions of Saint Charbel Makhlouf the, the patron <laughs> saint of Lebanon and thank yes. you so much for saying yes to my idea of visiting his yeah, monastery. We are going to have a course. pilgrimage, me, you, Nader, and Scott, at least, and maybe Amen. other people. And we're going to have a, a pilgrimage. Because everyone, everyone I've, I've been reading his book, people. It's quite amazing. Love yeah. is a Radiant Light by... Hallelujah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really yes. great. We're, we'll have to... I had this idea, Zania, that you could be a translator into Farsi for uh, some of his, <laughs> uh, his writings. All right? And it will, okay, thank you. All right, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. you again. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Springman. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. We love you. Bless we you. love thank you. Thank you. We love you all. Salam, salam, salam. All right, salam. take care, everybody. Peace. Bye. Okay, take care.